Hi, and welcome to the first video in a series of golf club building tutorials. I'm Russ, the producer of Devoted Golfer, Golf Shaft Reviews, and owner of Fit to Score. I've been building golf clubs for over 20 years now. I am now recognized as one of the top 100 club fitters and club builders in America. I started many years ago building my own clubs. That evolved into a club building and club fitting business, Fit to Score. My intent with this video series is to save you the years of trial and error I spent learning golf club building. When I started making my own clubs, there were several golf club making schools. I went to the Golfsmith School in Austin, Texas. The only school left now is run by GolfWorks in Newark, Ohio. If you learn best in a classroom, I recommend you investigate the GolfWorks Academy. If you prefer online learning, stay with me and subscribe to be notified of future courses. The YouTube description below has a list of topics covered in this video and their timeline markers. There are also links to the Cub Building Suppliers websites. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to the Devoted Golfer channel. Leave comments. They're important feedback to me and will guide the production of future club making videos. I'm going to show you the range of tools you will need if you are a golfer and want to regrip your own clubs. If you're in the business of regripping golf clubs, you will get to see how someone with 20 years of experience grips golf clubs. I built this workbench in my video studio and as you can see, there's lots of stuff to discuss here, so let's get started. There are a lot of ways to hold a shaft when you remove or install a grip. The most important tool in your shop is safety glasses. You only get one set of eyeballs in life, and if you damage them, the damage will be with you for a lifetime. We'll be working with fluids, compressed air, knives, razor blades, and various other things in this tutorial, all of which can damage your eyes. Do not take chances. Wear safety glasses when you work. While it's possible to get grips on and off without clamping the shaft, it's not something I recommend. It's difficult, and when something slips, you can hurt yourself. And I did not say if, I said when, because if something can happen, it will. Shaft clamps range from $10 to around $70. The simplest is a rubber clamp and some kind of gripping tool. So here's a simple block of wood, my rubber grippy thing, and a hardware store vice grip. So I'm going to put the shaft in the rubber thing. Slide it down, lay it on the table, put my vice grip over it, clamp it down. Now I'm going to rotate it so the head is perpendicular and clamp it down. So here it is, a very simple block of wood and a vice grip and the shaft is secure enough to my table that I can work the grips on and off. You can use the same rubber clamp in a vise. When using a vise, you may want to use this aluminum sided clamp. It's more durable than the rubber sided model. Both work fine. This simple vise clamps to any tabletop. I put the metal sided rubber clamp in the vise and I have an inexpensive golf club gripping rig. This is how I got started. If you're gripping more than the occasional personal project, you'll want a shaft clamp like this. It closes with a lever. With this one, pressure is ratcheted.
With this style, pressure is adjusted by turning this screw. So if you want more pressure, you turn the screw in. If you want less pressure, you turn the screw out. If you're working with lightweight graphite shafts, this is my preference. It can be bolted to a desk, clamped in a vise, or as you will see, part of a production gripping station. Here is my gripping station, produced by our sponsor, Golf Mechanics, and distributed in North America by Golfworks. There is a large range of gripping stations on their websites to meet your production volume and space requirements. This is perfect for me because I can bolt it to a table, as you see here, or mount it in a bench vise. Let's look at the components of this station. First, we have a clamp with the pressure screw that you saw earlier in the video. The station has a tape dispenser that I use for build-up tape. The shaft is centered over a solvent recovery pan. The pan has a drain tube. Now you can put this drain tube into a recovery jar on the floor or do what I do, let the fluid accumulate in the pan and in the tube, and when you're finished, simply drain the tube into a jar. I'm a bit clumsy, and this keeps me from kicking a jar on the floor over onto the floor. The truly unique part of this station is the head alignment guide. As I insert the club, I push it underneath this pulley, push it up against the face, and align the head with the lines on the guide. Now, when I clamp the shaft, I use this transparent guide to make sure that I have the shaft aligned perfectly with the head. Most of my grip installations are done with compressed air. This gripping station is perfect. When I'm using air, I remove the solvent tray. There's now nothing in my way when I blow grips on or off. On the floor, you'll see a small air compressor connected to my gripping nozzle. You'll see this used throughout the tutorial. Compressed air is easy to use and eliminates the mess involved with tape and solvent. Golf Mechanics harkens back to the early 90s and was instrumental in developing modern club making tools that replaced the older craft of persimmon heads. Golf Mechanics was thrust forward by the rise of Golfsmith and the popularity of Ralph Maltby, Tom Wishon, Jeff Summit, Jeff Sheets, Russ Ryden, and many other contributors to the science and art of club making. Golf Mechanics is now the preferred partner of club makers and OEMs worldwide and is known for its wide range of sophisticated, affordable, no nonsense club making tools and instruments. Most of the time when we're gripping, we first have to ungrip. So let's get our safety glasses on. We're going to put the shaft with the grip on it in our clamp. And we're going to use a razor tool with a hook knife. The reason for the hook knife is that I want to cut the grip without pushing a razor blade into the shaft, especially a graphite shaft. I wouldn't want to be damaging that shaft. So this is relatively simple. We hook the tip of the razor blade under the shaft. Now, be careful here. Do not pull this towards yourself, towards your hands, towards any of your extremities. Get to the side. Pull the knife up the grip, see how it snapped there at the end? If your hand had been over here, you could have put that razor blade into the hand, and I've seen some people cut themselves, really nasty cuts with this. Now I just take the grip, and there it is, we're done. In the last video, we talked about how to get a grip off with a razor blade, and in doing so, we destroyed the grip. There are times when you're going to want to save a grip. And so now we're going to show you ways to get a grip off 
and save the grip. So the first thing I'm going to do is get my safety glasses on. Now, whenever I'm dealing with grip fluid the way I'm about to, I'm going to put on some heavy-duty disposable rubber gloves. And I'm doing this because this stuff stinks. And I don't want that stink to spend the day with me. So, I've got heavy-duty disposable rubber gloves on because this fluid is going to get on my hands and I do not want my hands to smell all day long. Now, what I'm going to use here is a spring rod. Some people call it a V-groove tool. I'm going to use a pan to catch the excess fluid as it spreads around here and I spill it. And the pan I use is actually a dog bowl, or a dog food bowl, rather. Okay, so I've got my dog food bowl. I've got the grip in hand that I want to get off of this shaft. Now, remember in earlier videos I talked about never poking anything toward yourself. So here I'm going to very, very gently work this spring rod in between the grip and the shaft and try to get it not stuck in my glove. Okay, so there it is, and now my hand is out of the way. Now I'm gonna take some grip fluid, and I'm going to drop it in between the shaft and my rod. Dribble, dribble. There it goes, you can see it getting on the, in the dog food bowl already. Now I'm gonna push this down a little bit, and I'm going to spin the shaft around and I use the label to let myself know that I've spun 180 degrees. And you can see how it's slipping down in here. Now, I'm going to drop some more fluid in here, dribble, dribble. And I'm going to eventually fill this gap that I'm creating with my rod and the shaft with fluid. And that's going to... Let me slide this grip off, much the way it was slipped down with fluid. A little more solvent in there, and you see now why I'm wearing rubber gloves. And I push this down a little bit and turn it 360 degrees. There we go. She's getting looser. Get a little more in there. Push it down some more as I'm turning. I'm turning. I'm pushing. I'm turning. And I'm pushing. I'm turning and I'm pushing. I'm getting pretty close to the bottom here. Let's get a little more fluid in there. Dribble, dribble. Okay. I can see it's full all the way to the top now. And as I push this down and turn, push and turn, push and turn. There it is. I've got it because I can see the fluid coming out of the bottom. See that? Okay. So I'm going to get my rod out of here. And it may take a little work. Gently release it. Okay. And this grip is now loose. And I can just spin this grip off the shaft. So there it is. I've shaved this grip. Now, this grip wasn't necessarily worth saving. But you'll have circumstances where, for whatever reason, you're going to want to save a grip. This is one of the ways to do it. Now, what you have to do here is look inside the grip and look for tape, and then you use a brush like this to get in here, and if any tape residue is stuck, you work that tape residue onto the brush and get it out. Now, in this case, I could see when I looked in it that there was very, very little tape residue in there, and you can see a little piece of it came out, and it's up here near the tip, and there it goes. I got the rest of it out. So that's the process of getting a grip off of a shaft so you can reuse it. So we're now going to look at removing a grip using a pump and a needle. So there's a couple things to mention here about a pump and a needle. You want to make sure that the, um, that the connection between the pump and the can is tight so that you get good pressure if this is not working, you've got a couple of issues to look at. Number one, the needle could be plugged up, or this 
seal could not be good enough to pressurize the can. So we're using grip solvent, which is in, in the canister. Um, you notice that I have a raincoat on. This can leak and can spray, and if you're not careful, the spray will get on you. Hence, raincoat, because I don't want my clothes to smell all day, just like I don't want my hands to smell all day. So we're putting our rubber gloves back on. Now, one thing that I'm not going to do here is wear safety glasses. Instead of safety glasses, I'm going to wear a face mask. Because if and when this sprays, it's going to spray on my face, and just not on my face, or just not in my eyes, but on my face. And so I really don't like the way this stuff tastes. Okay, I'm also going to have a rag with me when I do this, and you'll see why in a moment or two. So let's get our shaft into our clamp. And I'm right-handed, so I'm going to walk around to the other side over here. Now, one of the things that you want to make sure of is that you don't stick yourself with this needle. And we're going to follow the same precautions that we do all other times, which is we never work towards our hands. We have both of our hands behind the sticky point. So I'm sticking that in to the through the grip so I can feel it bump up against the shaft. Now I'm going to get my rag and what's going to happen is that you're going to see the fluid building up in here until it gets to the tip and then it's going to start to leak out of the tip. So if you don't want to spray all over your shop you're going to put a rag over here. And now we start pumping and you can already see how it's swelling as the fluid moves in here and the swelling is moving down and down and down. I'm going to uncover this so you can see it actually start to come out here at the end. I can feel it leaking onto my fingers and there it is. It's out at the end. Okay, so this grip is loose. See that? Now before I pull this needle out, I'm going to cover it up like that. Give the shaft a little bit of a twist and it's off fairly effortless. I've used this system for years. I just am very careful about using it in a way that it won't spray all over me or all over my shop. So we've looked at several ways of getting the grip off the shaft. Now we have an underlay of tape that's still on the shaft and we have to make a decision here about whether we're going to take this off and restart with a clean grip or whether we're going to simply go over what was here. Now you can see on this grip, let me get this into the camera here, that somebody already went over the original layer of tape. They put another layer of tape on it. So this is going to be a little bit of a beast to deal with. Let me get it in my clamp and set it up so that this top layer is up here where I can work at it. Now, this is a paint removing gun. It gets very, very hot. This is not a hair dryer. This is a hardware store paint department heat gun. Now, this tip gets extremely hot and the blast coming out of here will take off paint. It will also take off your skin and it will melt things on your bench that it gets in contact with. So you need to be very careful where you set this thing down when you're finished using it. In my shop, I actually have a hook underneath my bench that I hook it on to make sure that that tip won't touch anything when it's hot. So let's heat this tape up here because heat will soften the glue and it will soften this tape and it will make it easier to get the tape off. So we're getting this thing good and hot because I know this is going to be a difficult one to get off. We've got multiple layers of tape here. So I'm going to set this gun aside and I'm going to catch an edge of this tape that's nice and hot now. And I'm going to see if I can work this off by just pulling on that edge. And it didn't come the whole way. So I'm rolling it a little bit, see if I can get it restarted. 
we've got some of it coming off, but it is not cooperating. Now, we've got a tool here, and this tool is distributed by GolfWorks, and it's made by Golf Mechanics. It has a rounded steel edge on it, so I can get this on the shaft. Not necessarily something you would want to use on carbon fiber shafts, but on steel shafts, we're fine. Now, once again, I'm going to use this tool this way. I'm not pulling towards myself. So I'm going to get this underneath this tape and pull down towards the butt. And you can see how the tape is stripping off as I pull on it. Now, that wasn't too bad. I've got kind of a mess here, but I've got edges that I can pull on once I heat them up. I do the same thing here. I'm going to get my gun out, get some heat on here. Let's see if we can't get this rolling off nice and neatly in one piece. Turn it up a little bit. Here's an edge. I'm going to pull on that. I got that piece off. See how I'm rolling those edges with my fingers? They're coming off because they're hot. Not so hot that I'm going to burn myself, but hot enough to loosen up the adhesive that's on this tape and get this grip off, or get the tape off this grip. There we go. Let's roll it some more, get another look at it. And there we go. We've got all of the tape off. Now, what we do have left here is some very, very sticky residue. Once again, before I work with grip solvent, I'm getting my hands covered up so they don't smell all day. This is grip solvent from Golf Works. It has a nice citrus smell to it, so we've got a little bit of a citrus note in there, but it's not enough citrus that it's going to not stink up my hands for the whole day. So that's the reason for the gloves. Let's drop a little bit of this onto a paper towel and I'm just going to rub up and down with grip solvent on the grip, or on the shaft rather. And there it is. I have a shaft perfectly cleaned and ready to be retaped and regripped. In the last few videos, we've looked at getting grips off that had been glued onto a shaft over tape and then getting the tape off the shaft. This is going to be simpler. We're looking at using compressed air to get grips off that had been blown on. Now, the first thing I'm going to do at all times, put my safety glasses on. What you don't see here is a vest, and what you don't see here are disposable rubber gloves because we're not using solvent. Now, we are going to be using pure grips. Pure grips are available in a number of colors, and in a number of sizes and textures. They've been designed specifically to be blown on and off. And Pure Grip sells a air gun with a tip on it for blowing grips on and off. So let's take one of the clubs out of my set, which have Pure Grips on them. I like them because they're very durable and they retain their tackiness in the Texas heat for many years. Put it in our clamp, put the nozzle into the hole of the grip. We're done. And we don't have to take the tape off because we're going to blow the next grip onto this shaft over the existing tape. It's that simple. My favorite way of putting grips on and off is compressed air. So let's start this discussion with safety. First, safety classes. Next, compressed air comes from an air compressor, which is typically a fairly noisy device, especially if you're in a small shop. So we should consider industrial-style hearing protection. 
Now, there's another good reason for hearing protection, because on very rare occasion, you can explode a grip. And I'm going to actually show you this grip explode here in a few minutes. But it took me 15 grips before I found one that would explode, and it was a fairly old one that I could actually get to demonstrate this with. So let me go ahead and show you a grip exploding, and you'll understand hearing protection. So you've seen me explode one. Now, a long time ago, a club-making mentor taught me that if I wanted to have a grip not explode, specifically this style of grip, that I would use a needle or I would use a nail, and I would put some holes in this section of the grip before I put the compressed air to it so that any air that would build up in here and would cause this section to expand would have a way to escape before it exploded the grip. So let's take a quick look at how that's done. I just take a needle, rotate the grip a little bit, poke a hole, poke another hole, poke another hole, poke another hole. And so now I can pretty safely put this grip on without worrying about air building up in here and exploding the grip. Now, another safety device to keep you from harming yourself when a grip explodes is an insertion gun like this that has the ability to slip a plastic sleeve over the grip. And there's a small one and there's a large one for putter grips. Very unlikely that you're ever going to explode a putter grip, but there it is. Okay, I've cleaned up the bench. Let's get this grip on the shaft with compressed air. Now, traditionally, you're putting a grip on a shaft with a piece of tape underneath it. And we're going to show in a future video how tape affects grip diameter. So we don't want to not do what is done traditionally, which is have a piece of tape underneath here, which is going to slightly change the diameter of the grip. So I'm going to put a single piece of build-up tape on the shaft before I put the grip on. I'm going to use the shaft as a tape measure, and I'm going to measure off some tape right there. And I'm going to sli slightly stick it onto the shaft right there, and I'm going to check that it's not going to stick out from the tip of the grip when I blow the grip over it. Now, you notice that I put the tip of the tape here and the other diagonal tip at the butt because I want to corkscrew this tape on for a couple reasons. One is if there's a taper in this shaft, the corkscrewing will get the tape on flat without wrinkling because of the taper. Now, the other thing that corkscrewing does is it keeps me from having a seam in one spot along the grip. So I am smoothing the tape on, put my air compressor into the tip, get the tip started over the butt, and just work the grip up with compressed air. Wasn't that easy. I'm going to use my alignment guide to make sure that I've got this thing perfectly aligned with the head. And I'm all set. Well, I'm back. So we're going to talk about different sources of air to blow a grip on and off with. This is a tire inflator made by Robi. It's battery operated. And let's not forget our safety glasses. Safety glasses are on. And what this does, it could inflate your tires. Here I'm going to put this little sports nozzle in that's used to inflate uh, your basketball. 
Okay, and I'm going to set this up for about 45 pounds. There we go. Now, remember our home system for clamping shafts. I'm going to grab a shaft here, and I'm going to put my little rubber grippy thing on it. Shove it down here near the butt. I'm going to grab my vice clamp. Get it on the shaft. Let's set this thing upwards like that. Give it a little more pressure. And I'm going to take my inflator nozzle. Make sure I'm out there at around 46 pounds. Turn this on. And I'm just going to shove this. Oh. Okay, so you can see that it's not necessary to have an industrial compressor to blow grips on and off. A simple tire inflator that you can use around the house to check tire pressure in your car will do it for you. The traditional way of putting grips on a shaft is to use grip tape. So let's look at the components that are necessary to do that. We can get grip tape in pre-cut lengths from our sponsor Golfworks, and the kit comes with a grip sizing gauge. We're not going to be doing grip sizing in this episode. It will be covered extensively in another episode. So here we're just going to put a grip on a shaft using grip tape. Now, Group tape is sticky on both sides. Whoops. So you can see how it's tacking to both of my fingers. This is a pre-cut kit. It also comes in rolls. And it has, as you can see here, a backing tape. And then a dispenser like this, the backing tape is rolled up as the tape is pulled out. So here's how that works and we pull off our length of tape. Now, let's take a closer look at how we set up a dispenser like this if it has a metering gauge on it. Let's take a quick look at how we set the length of tape that comes out of this dispenser. I'm going to get the buildup tape out of the way. There's a screw right here that sets this lever to stop. Now, the way that works is as tape comes out, this will move up to a stop right there, and then when you cut the tape, it spins back. So let's see how much tape we're going to get at this position. Pull it out, and that's not quite enough. So let me reset, get the tape out of the way. I'm going to loosen the screw. The lever is now free to, to turn. There we go. And so I'm going to turn this in this direction and find another spot. Tighten the screw back into the hole. Okay, we got it. Let's let it reset itself here. And let's take a look at how much tape we pull now. There it is. It stopped. Bingo. And you can see we have a longer length. So you work this until you get the length of tape you like to work with. Now, the other thing, of course, that we need is a solvent. And so here's a solvent from our sponsor, Golfworks. Now... Let's not forget safety glasses. And you're thinking, well, I'm just putting a grip over a shaft. Why am I wearing safety glasses? Well, here's why. I'm looking under directions for use, and over here, first aid, it says, eye contact for eyes, flush with plenty of water for 15 minutes and get medical attention. Okay? Get medical attention. Safety glasses.
Now, some grips need to be glued on. You can't put them on with air. And so here's an example of one of those. And they have an inner core. And what you see over here is a seam. Let me get this in the camera so you can see it. When you see a seam like this, it means it's over an inner core. And this grip will probably slip over time if you put it on with compressed air. This is a seamless grip. It's going to go on just fine. So let's look at the process of doing this. I'm going to meter out my tape. Now remember how I put the tape on diagonally in the past? So I'm going to do that again. I'm going to stick it on the shaft right there. Now let's do a little check here with the grip and make sure that the tape isn't sticking out over the end of the grip. It would be in this case. So I'm going to pull this up a little bit and make sure that it is where I want it to be. Okay, there it is. So it's not going to be sticking out of the end of the grip when I put it on. Now, just like I did in the past, I'm corkscrewing this on there, and I'm corkscrewing it on over here. And that's to deal with taper. And now I'm tucking the excess tape into the back of the shaft and that's going to form a seal so that moisture can't get in. So there we are, we're all set up. Now I'm putting on my gloves because I don't like getting solvent on my hand for a couple reasons. Number one, read the warning on here. Number two, it stinks. And I don't like to stink. So that's on. I grab my grip solvent plug up the bottom of the grip with my finger, a little hole in the grip, pour solvent into the grip, get a bunch of it in there, and now I slosh it around really good so the entire inside of the grip is covered. Now I'm going to put this over the grip and I'm going to remove my finger from the bottom and let the solvent pour liberally onto the grip. Now I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here once this is poured onto the tape, I want to get this on very quickly. Run it over the back, slide it up. Now it's still loose and can move around. And I'm going to use my alignment gauge here to make sure that I've got the label where I want it, either label up or many golfers like and prefer to have label down. So here I'm looking at this grip and putting label down and now alignment is not so critical because I can't see the label. Okay. Okay, we're done. We've got the grip on. We've used solvent. I'll set this aside over here. Now you probably want to let this dry 30 minutes to an hour before you go and hit it because as you can see right now, until this solvent dries, I can still twist this grip around. So it's going to take a little while for this to dry before I can put it in play. The Golf Works is the largest supplier of golf club components, tools, and supplies in the world. Founded in 1974 by Ralph Maltby, the Golf Works is a leading educator in the fields of golf club design, fitting, alteration, and repair. Ralph and the Golf Works team are considered the utmost authority on club fitting and the principles of club fitting that were developed by Ralph decades ago and are still used today by professional golf club fitters. As a design company, the Golf Works has developed many innovative designs and design principles, influencing the design landscape of golf companies worldwide. Now that we've seen the mechanics of installing grips, let's talk a bit about grip size. As I thought about this section of the video, I decided to stay with the mechanics of creating grip sizes and avoid a discussion about grip size fitting. The discussion of grip size fitting is an entire video series in itself. We have three aspects to discuss. Grip sizes, internal diameter of grips, and installed size. Grips are primarily sold as underside, standard, 
mid, and jumbo. Different brands have different terms for sizes, but they all relate in some fashion to this list. If you're regripping, the best practice is to measure the existing grip before you cut them off. This is a grip sizing gauge. Grip is traditionally, grip size is traditionally taken two inches down from the grip cap. This tool lets you identify that spot. I'm holding my thumb at the two inch mark. Then you slide the grip down one of the slots in the gauge and find the grip diameter by finding the slot that stops two inches from the butt. Now we know what size we want to end up with. There are three factors to be considered. Inner diameter of the grip, thickness of the grip, and diameter of the shaft. Not all grips have the same inner diameter. Some are marked with their inner diameter at the tip end. Many grip companies now put inner diameter dimensions on the grip label. On this undersized grip, 0.58R is here on the label. On this standard size grip, the diameter is marked 60R. The term ID is shorthand for inner diameter, and you will hear me use it as this discussion progresses. The term OD is likewise shorthand for outer diameter. So we can see how this shaft with a single piece of tape resulted in a standard grip size, 0.9. Now we're going to add a couple of pieces of build-up tape. I'm using the grip as a tape measure. Cut off my tape and I'm starting the tip at a different point when I do my corkscrew wrap to make sure that I don't get seam overlap on the tapes. So I'm tucking it around very carefully and making sure that I don't get any wrinkles in the tape. Let's get out another piece of tape here once again using the grip itself as a tape measure. Now I don't want to start the tip of this tape any lower than the tape that's already on there because I don't want the tip of the tape sticking out from the tip of the grip once I get it on. So once again carefully wrapping it around. Now tuck the butt end into the grip and let's get out the air and get this grip worked over the shaft. Now it's going to be a little more difficult here because instead of one piece of tape we've got three pieces of tape and as I work this grip up the shaft you see that I'm having to twist it a little bit and work it and it's not quite all the way down there so I'm twisting it a little more and getting it all the way down in the shaft. Okay, we're ready. Let's measure the effect of the change of shaft diameter on grip size. So I'm looking for the next spot up here, and it surely does, in fact, snug up. And so I, by adding two pieces of tape, I've changed this grip size to 164th oversize, 0.915. When you put a grip over a shaft, it stretches changing its outer diameter. When we put a 5.58 ID grip on a .60 shaft, it will be larger than a .60 ID grip put on the same shaft if the two grips have the same thickness. This is where our second factor, thickness of a grip, affects the final grip size. A Golf Pride undersize with a .58 ID installed on a .60 shaft has a size of .88 inches. The standard 6.0 grip size on the same shaft is .91 inches. The undersized grip is smaller because the grip is not as thick as the standard size grip. So you're now asking, why make a grip with a 0.58 ID? Well, the outer diameter of many lightweight shafts is smaller than the mid and heavyweight shafts. So it makes sense to make an undersized grip with a smaller ID so they will fit snugly on the smaller lightweight shafts. That brings us to the third factor in grip sizing, shaft diameter. Shaft butt diameters of most shafts are available on my website, 
www.golfshaftreviews.info. I measure shaft butt diameter with a caliper. A caliper has squared clamps. I let the shaft hang freely and snug up in the squared clamps, then read the diameter. This is a machine shop gauge on a piece of precisely ground granite. Let's look at tape thickness. This piece of two-sided tape is 0.075 inches thick. A single piece of blue painter's tape is 0.045 inches thick and two pieces of blue tape are 0.09 inches. Different tapes used for club buildup may have different thicknesses. If you have a gauge to measure what you use, do so. I applied one piece of blue tape, then measured the grip size of a Golf Pride Tour Velvet. Then applied more tape and repeated the process. The shaft diameter increased an average of 0.07 inches per wrap, and the grip size increased the same, about 0.07 inches per piece of tape. I measured how many pieces of tape were needed to make a standard grip a mid-size grip. I found that seven pieces of blue tape were needed to size a standard tour velvet grip to match a mid-size tour velvet grip. You should not think this will hold on other grip models and brands. I like working with blue painter's tape. It's easy to remove and available at a local hardware store. Our sponsor, Golfworks, offers traditional build-up tapes with different thicknesses. Whatever build-up tape you use, it's best to do a little experimenting to understand how the tape you use changes grip size. Let's take a quick look at grip weight. The standard Tour Velvet I use weighed 51.6 grams. The mid-size, 54.8 grams. A single piece of blue tape weighs 1.2 grams. Seven layers of tape, 8.5 grams. The standard grip plus seven layers of tape weighed, weighs 60.2 grams. One layer of tape plus the mid-size grip weighed 56 grams. Does four grams of butt weight matter? Well, if you're doing swing weighting, it may. If you're doing MOI matching, not that much. But let me caution you here. It's rather difficult getting that standard grip over seven layers of tape. What about lower hand buildup as we see in the Golf Pride Plus 4 grips? This is a Tour Velvet Plus 4 and this is a MCC Plus 4. I do a lot of lower hand buildup. I did the same test with blue tape on the lower hand for a Tour Velvet and compared it to the Tour Velvet Plus 4. It took seven pieces of blue tape to make a Tour Velvet Plus 4 out of a standard Tour Velvet grip. With this bit of knowledge, you can create the Plus 4 lower hand size with any grip. As I said at the start of this lesson, this is about how to change grip size. Determining proper grip size is an entire video course. Shaft butt diameter, build-up tape, grip inner diameter, and grip thickness all contribute to grip size. Always keep in mind, shaft diameter changes grip size. There you have it, my video book about gripping golf clubs. When I started building my own clubs around 20 years ago, there were a lot of places to learn club building. There were schools, books, organizations. The first builder organization meeting I attended had well over 500 attendees and numerous breakout sessions. Much of that is gone now, and I have not seen a new book in years. This was the inspiration for creating this V-Book. I hope this helps those who enjoy playing golf clubs they've personally built and perfected. 
If you are trusting your golf club building to someone else, you need to have some fundamental knowledge to evaluate the skills of the craftsmen you've chosen. If you work in a club shop, you may have picked up a few tricks of the trade from someone that has been at it for a long time. Please evaluate this course with a like, leave comments so I can improve future lessons, and subscribe, letting me know that I should produce more lessons like this. Thanks for spending your time with me, and get out there and play good golf.